hello and welcome everyone. All right, I will just bring up uh, Spencer, our director here. Bear with me a moment. There we go. All right. So welcome to Samaki Fest and to our Q&A session with Alice Street. We're happy to have Spencer Wilkinson join us today to share some of his insights on making the film. Thank you again for giving us the opportunity to present your amazing film with our audiences and joining us today. Alice Street was directed and produced by Spencer Wilkinson. Uh, Spencer Wilkinson is a director and cinematographer known for Alice Street, Alice Street the Short, and One Voice, the story of Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir. Uh, I will let Spencer, jump in now and introduce our guest as well, Desi. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having us. Um, you can hear me okay? Yep, you're all good. Awesome. Great. Um, yeah, well, wonderful to be on Filmocracy Fest and um, excited to also introduce and um, have join us uh, Desi Mundo, um, who is a um, featured artist in the film, uh, one of the lead muralists, uh, if for those of the who are joining us now who just came from the film, you'll remember Desi as being um, kind of from the from the start to the finished, um, you know, big part of the story. Uh, so really grateful to have him. He's also the executive director of the Community Rejuvenation Project, which is a um, organization in Oakland uh, where we both reside and um, very well known uh, for painting community murals around the Bay Area and also having a really uh, a focus on policy. And as you saw in the film, his engagement around, um, you know, what's happening around gentrification in Oakland and what many per perhaps other folks who might be on this um, experience in their own cities. Um, mm. But yeah, I'm really excited to also introduce uh, Desi Mundo. Welcome. Yes, welcome, welcome. Um, so how did you both meet and decide you wanted to tell this story? Cool. Well, um, you know, uh, I had known of Desi and I'd known of CRP, which uh, again, the, the organization that he founded um, for some years because I was very much involved in a lot of the nonprofit um, kind of community in Oakland. So I'd seen the murals, you know, um, I'd met Desi a couple of times, just in kind of in passing. Um, and then heard that he and CRP were going to be painting a mural on Alice Street. And at the time, I was actually living on Alice Street, um, just a couple of blocks from this mural site. So um, I think I reached out to Desi, or no, maybe he reached out to me. Um, well, we connected with each other about the project, um, him knowing that I was in kind of close proximity and a filmmaker, and um, kind of asked if I could help uh, with their process. Uh, which was to do a lot of interviews in the community um, to understand the story that they wanted to then depict um, on the wall. So, um, mm. so yeah, he kind of brought me in early on and I helped to do a lot of these interviews and um, played a, in a sense, a role in the, in the making of the mural and, and then the story kind of um, went from there. Yeah, right. Um, I guess Desi, the, yeah, the mural speaking of is such an amazing piece of artwork. Can you kind of let us know about your artistic background and your ongoing work painting community-based murals in the Bay Area? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been a aerosol writer for the past 30 years. Um, and I did my first mural back in 1994. Um, that was a piece that I, I brought my teeth to train under. So I, I, I got a space and I had a theme and um, it was the, a memorial for the Chicago's first black mayor, Harold Washington, who uh, lived in my neighborhood. And so um, I've been doing, you know, kind of like the community based murals for a long time. Um, when I moved to Oakland in 1999, um, we just kind of kept things going. I had just kind of graduated from college. And so over the past well, over the we, we we charted on CRP time, which um, kicked off really in two thousand and eight. It was an idea before that, but um, we've done about three hundred murals in, uh, in that time, and I've been a, a, an artist and a, and a project manager on just about all of them. Um, and we just uh, we just wrapped up our, our biggest mural to date, 
which also my my first real acrylic mural, um, which is the to Alice Street, which is called a Send Dance, and it's in uh, a few blocks from where the Alice Street mural was done. It's on that, mm. that route that people marched on, um, and uh, you know that's that's ninety feet tall. It's the biggest one that we've worked on to date, and so yeah, right. I'm getting ready to do another one in, in, in Berkeley uh, in the spring. So I'm really excited for that as well. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty in incredible. Um, can you also maybe speak to the murals and these icons of culture and kind of why that is so important to communities being affected by gentrification? I mean, you know, murals have a double-edged sword because they've been used to kind of beautify communities to entice new residents to come in and they can have the capacity to um, erase culture and erase the identity of a neighborhood. You see that in like Wynwood in Miami, uh, which has become a huge hub for Art Basel, but was actually, there was like a, you know, a cultural community that existed there prior. And none of the murals speak to that community that existed. And um, those people have been pushed out and are not even really accepted to allow, to go into the art galleries and stuff that have sprung up. And so it's like, if the murals aren't telling the story of the people who are there, especially in neighborhoods that are transitioning, you're, for, you're losing that history, you're forgetting. Um, and, mm. you know, so when we started Alice Street, we, we, uh, um, in the mural, we knew that gentrification was on its way. It was arriving in downtown. There was a lot of development in terms of the clubs and uh, nightlife, which when I lived in downtown, actually me and Spencer, lived in the same building for a little while, um, oh, yeah. way back in the day. <laughs> uh, and that's around the corner from Alice Street. So I kind of had mm. listened to the drums at the Malanga through our through the back window, you know. Mm. Um, wow. So like there's a, a, you know, like we knew that that was coming. So we wanted to put markers there to say, look, this exists. Because in that lot, it's just an ugly lot. You know, people go, oh, well, there's nothing here. And right across the streets, this cultural hub. And we're just going to build without thinking about it. And we actually did have developers come up, not necessarily in that lot, who were thinking about, oh, I'm going to do this great thing for artists and paid over part of your mural. And we're like, what? And we stopped them, you know, mm. uh, from, from doing that. And um, they, they understood that this is like, a, you're, you're moving into a community, you're going to erase some of the, the cultural icons on this wall for your own personal edification. Like, that's not going to fly. And so we always had that in mind that we were like trying to like hold space and like put up a little barrier for resistance um, for what was coming in next, you know? Yeah, right. Uh, Spencer, is anything you kind of want to elaborate on that as well, growing up in kind of Oakland and being near the mural kind of most of your life as well? Oh, well, you know, I didn't actually grow up in, in Oakland. I was living. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I moved to Oakland in 2000. Um, okay. So it's been a while now. Kind of my, my adult life has been yeah. kind of in between Oakland and San Francisco, just to clarify that piece of it. Um, but, you know, I was living on Alice Street uh, when the mural began, which was actually in 2013. Uh, the okay. mural kind of uh, actually was maybe the end of, yeah, the beginning of mid-2013 mid, mid, mid 2013 that they were kind of like coming up with the idea. So really, this I followed the story from 2013 until we finished production in 2019. Um, wow. And then kind of completed the edit uh, earlier 2020. Um, but, yeah, I mean, murals... Like Desi mentioned, I mean, he's really the expert on the topic, but they play this dual, you know, double-edged sword, right? They can mm, attract, absolutely. you know, new people into a community that might not be from there based on the art and the culture that's represented. Um, but they can also be this really important, um, and what we found from this story from Alice Street, um, as an important cultural marker and um, communicating a lot of history and education to newcomers to understand mm -hmm. who is from that neighborhood and what are the important kind of um, attributes that people need to respect um, and honoring, you know, that legacy um, if they're done in that manner. And, you know, people are going to paint a variety of different ways. You know, all artists are kind of different. And so I wouldn't, you know, want to put everyone in a box of you, you. This is the way to do it. But in this case, um, the painting, the mural that they painted ended up being a, a, a catalyst for diverse communities in Oakland 
to come together and fight for um, issues that they they had in common. So, you know, the power of public art, I, it's it's immense. You know, it's much beyond just, you know, kind of beauty and, and decoration. You know, it can really carry a message. It can carry history. You know, and this has been, you know, known from, you know, time memorial, right? That humans have used art to communicate and pass language and, and also to um, speak out for causes. So it's definitely not the first time that that's happened. But in this case, it was really uh, immense, but the impact it had. Yeah, exactly. And kind of adding to your point um, to other communities that might be going through similar scenarios, is there a way that um, advice or ways that we can get our voices heard in other communities? Uh, definitely. Yeah, I think public art is one of those tactics. Mm -hmm. um, I think what uh, we really learned from the experience of kind of watching this story play out was that by focusing on two really diverse communities, the African diasporic community at the Malanga Center, and then the kind of Asian diasporic community, um, primarily Chinese seniors at the Hotel Oakland, that by mm -hmm. focusing on these really diverse communities that were right across the street from each other, that might not have had a lot of interaction prior, um, it brought people together. And I think that looking towards communities outside of yourselves that might be experiencing similar issues and finding ways to form coalitions is was the strength that really um, led to the fight for community benefits, the winning of all of these wonderful agreements um, that went on to create real legacy support uh, for, for those communities in Oakland. So I hope that can be an inspiration, you know, and I, I imagine there's a lot of other communities that are working out other ways to deal with gentrification, especially now and COVID and, yeah. you know, the economy and, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot of pressure and stress potentially for communities and how they respond and, and look for, you know, outside of their own to find common strength, I think is, is a big theme of, of the story and what we hope can be an inspiration for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely, yeah, definitely agree with you there. Um, just jumping to a Q and a kind of that, question that's just come in along the similar topic. Um, Ian is asking, do you think graffiti is also a part of community cultures? So graffiti in the sense of um, the murals and everything like that. Maybe Desi, if you want to speak to that. I mean, we don't use that terminology. It's a derogatory term. Um, but in general, uh, you know, yeah, spray can art and all, all the stuff that we do with our, with our, with our spray paint, it comes from inner city youth. And so uh, generally speaking, historically, there's been um, youth in all of these different inner cities that have, you know, used it to express their identity and their existence in the face of, uh, you know, the fact that we're always being erased and and, um, and we're kind of competing with the billboards and, and the advertisements um, throughout the city in terms of a battle over visual space. Um, and so, you, again, like that that demographic has, has changed with the the, the, the growth of, of what we call street art, which is kind of these people using our aerosol aesthetic, but not having that connection to the community. Um, a lot, you know, what, what that means is that street art is done by people that are a little bit more mobile and a little bit more affluent um, and people who travel a lot more. And it's been based on developing like your own personal little icons and stuff like that in a lot of cases. Now, obviously there's other people that, that kind of come with a different approach um, mm. But I think that, you know, so like we understand that writing culture is the origin of this bigger explosion where people are using much more image based. But a lot of those folks don't even know the history of our writing culture. And so we, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be broken down. But it's also a very much a tool for, um, you know, resistance to to gentrification. Um, and, and particularly in the Bay Area, there's been a movement by writers to kind of challenge um, the, you know, the use of even murals to, to fly. And you can go and splash a mural pretty quickly if it's not related back to your community. We've seen it happen in Oakland. Mm. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I was just switching gears a little bit to actual filmmaking process, Spencer. Um, was there any surprises or discovery along the way uh, making this film that you kind of maybe want to speak about? Definitely. Um, I mean, 
I think going into the filmmaking process, I thought it was documenting a mural and kind of the, the diverse cultures that existed on one intersection and what would go on to the walls, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Oakland was going through a very fast paced um, tra transformation due to forces of gentrification, you know, and I see some great questions coming up uh, around, you know, how, how do you kind of halt gentrification? And is there ways that communities can really have a voice in this case? And, and I think that, you know, um, it, unfortunately, it kind of falls on community to work to, to change policy because cities are not really necessarily city kind of officials and leaders are not taking the lead to create policies that protect people who exist in those, those communities and to keep the rents down and keep, you know, um, cities from, you know, uh, to be sustainable. Um, so I think that the surprise for me really in the making of the film was to see for one that, you know, it was really an experiment of like, all right, let's talk to these two diverse communities. Let's find out their common stories or what their, you know, their beautiful diversity and um, see what imagery can go on these walls. But to know that a coalition would form between those communities mm -hmm. and they would fight for community benefit agreements from new developments in, the, in their city was a huge surprise. They won over $20 million in community benefits that went, to, you know, directly to policies to support um, community, you know, community staying rooted um, through, you know, artist art funding, um, through grants being made to people being impacted by displacement towards low income housing, to get people on boards uh, to determine what type of real retail would, would exist in those new buildings. So that was a huge surprise. Um, and just the, the overall engagement um, that people had. Um, and I, just really quickly, I saw another great question about like how this film might be used. And we're really hoping that we actually got a couple of grants to bring the film into community, other communities impacted by gentrification and to have dialogues uh, with them around um, solutions. And we hope that the film can be not only kind of an inspiration, but also a way in which more discussion can happen. Because this is just one story, right? There's every city has its own story. <laughs> And we want to hear from others and, and, and create a common kind of um, have a discussion together and, and, and be able to share those findings uh, with others that, that might might be helpful for. Them, so. Can I piggyback on that for a second? Oh, what are the please? Yes. Yeah. One of the things that I want to point out is that those were the community benefits that we got from developers in the downtown area. So literally the city council um and all of the politicians were completely unsuccessful probably even disinterested in actually getting stuff for the existing communities in the downtown area when that took place and so um i think that one of the the super important points is that part artists partnering with, like other organizations that are uh, involved in civic policy is really important um, we are, we're, our job is to kind of, you know, make revolution irresistible. And at the same time, we also need to be having concrete solutions and an understanding of what, you know, um, development without displacement looks like. And, and so it's very, it was a good partnership between like the people that understood policy and the people that created the buzz and the excitement around that, that led to that, that, that snowball, which ended up being $20 million in community benefits. Um, so that's a really like central part is like building past the artists and connecting to larger groups of community. The coalition became very wide. And I think that that's, what, that's where our strength lies. And I think that, you know, that can be kind of replicated in different cities, not like a stamp, you know, each city needs to have its own response because each city has its own, you know, cultural hubs and its own things that it wants to preserve. But I also think mm -hmm. that we need to start thinking proactively before the gentric gentrification arrives about what parts of our community we want to hold on to and how do we create policy in advance of people moving in rather than chasing after developments that are already in process. And that was one of the challenges that that coalition faced was that 
a development will be announced over here, then over here, and it'll be popping up all over the place. And they were chasing them as they were coming out versus coming up with kind of like a set um, requirement for developers to even show up in the first place. So we have to think, you know, strategically. Yeah, that's some yeah great advice is kind of just thinking ahead and planning as well in order to kind of have their voices heard. So that's very helpful in that sense. I'm just adding to kind of Spencer and what we're kind of talking about in terms of the call to action and the influence of the film and its education purposes. Um, do you have any other plans for distribution or feature screenings or maybe educational screenings that we can learn about? For sure, yeah. I mean, we've been just really grateful for the response the film's had. So far, we had a really wonderful festival tour over the last couple of months and screened um, around the country and then a couple international sites as well. In fact, we just heard from the city of Calgary's planning department uh, in Ca Calgary, Canada. Uh, they're bringing the film to have their urban planning department uh, view the film and then have discussion about, you know, forces of gentrification in Calgary. Um, we had a great wow. discussion in London uh, with folks about gentrification there um, based around the film. So it's um, we're, we're definitely seeing it as a, a, a tool that could be a, a good, you know, um, again, way in which to have impact. And so we were planning an impact tour in spring of 2021, uh, funded by the California Council for um, the Arts, uh, California Arts Council and San Francisco Foundation, uh, who both sponsor uh, this tour. Uh, and as well as in uh, in communities in California and then also in Chicago. Um, and we just um, kind of uh, agreed to, to have a, an educational distributor take the film um, and we'll be excited to get it into schools um, right. and um, universities, high schools. Uh, we're really excited about Oakland um, students getting to see the film and a couple neighboring uh, districts that have showed interest. So yeah, it feels like the beginning of a journey and, um, you know, we're so excited again to be part of Filmocracy and to have this opportunity um, to see this really interesting model of, you know, virtual engagement. Um, Y'all have done a great job with that. So um, we, we hope to piggyback off of your success, see how we continue <laughs> yeah. showing films in this time, you know, uh, when it's yeah, just, exactly. uh, really. Oh, oh no. <laughs> just in the middle of it oh no I that, uh, one, i'm also a, a you know a, um a middle school and high school art teacher and mm -hmm. spencer hired one of my gra students that graduated from my high school to uh help um do the graphic design on the curriculum so it's like we're keeping it in the community um and it's that's that's just something i, I wanted to add because i'm proud you know yeah you know but i think that like yeah i think that there's a really important piece about using this type of artwork to help you know to the history of their communities you know um so i've been you know trying to help them with uh getting an interactive map of the mural on the wall actually learn about the different um the different people that are depicted because it's valuable to see them but it's another thing to actually learn about them and mm. so be able to you know like expand people's um opportunities to engage with the mural is a really mm. important part of this piece and that and that's you know fortunately you know just as as the artist to see a film grow up around it and and then you know people can uh more people tap into the impact of just you know, driving by that intersection and happening to see it, you know. So I'm really mm -hmm. fortunate that we, that Spencer decided to make this film and really thankful that that um, he told the story. And then, you know, none of us knew that when we were, you know, when he was filming us to talk about just painting it, that all this stuff would happen. <laughs> mm, yeah, so, no, it sounds like an absolutely incredible journey. And to have that kind of impact as a filmmaker, that's kind of the dream is to, make something and for it to get such great recognition. So also just speaking to that, as we have a lot of kind of young uh, filmmakers that are here and watching. Um, Spencer, do you have any advice for aspiring filmmakers maybe in the documentary space and how to kind of get started? Oh, well, I mean, I um, wouldn't, you know, speak, say I'm speaking from a, you know, vast wisdom, but I've learned a lot from other, you know, veteran filmmakers that, you know, it's all about the team you create 
Um, and um, it's such a team sport, documentary filmmaking. And it does require a lot of patience. Mm. You know, this was a seven year long, six and a half year long process. My last film was about four and a half years, um, which I'm not saying all films have to take that duration. I hope they don't. Um, but I, I learned a lot, you know, from the people I worked with and finding a really strong sound um, engineer to work with on the back end or finding really strong cinematographers, people who are better in their skill set than I am. You know, I did a lot of the shooting for Owl Street, but I also brought in a lot of folks that, you know, and said, hey, can you show up at this action? Um, you know, and I think too, it's the, you know, it's a long game. Um, and I think a lot of people just go for, you know, a grant, a single grant, write a grant and think, you know, if they didn't get the grant, um, you know, oh, they're, they're not meant to be a filmmaker. And mm -hmm. you know, we wrote, I don't know, 50 grants probably in the course of, of the making of this film and got, mm. you know, maybe 10. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot of denials and a lot of, you know, having to pick yourself up and coming up with a new idea and a new approach, learning from mistakes um, and going to, you know, um, I think also the city of Oakland's cultural funding program was a really important kind of partner in a sense to create and to get some support early on to kind of help fuel the film. But it happened in stages and it happened over time and it took a lot of just persistence and um, patience. And I think just showing up, continuing to show up and, and understand what the story is. And um, last thing I would say is again, around building relationships, it's building relationships with your production team and having you know talented people. It's also really building relationships with your subjects and building a sense of trust and um, finding ways to create um, you know, mutually benefit beneficial opportunities with your subjects so that they don't feel like they're just giving, giving, giving all the time, but they feel some sense of they're part of um, the overall goal. I think that's important. Um, mm. Yeah, definitely. That helpful. is, yeah, it is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're just kind of nearing the end of our time here. Is there anything else kind of that either you want to say or also where we can find out how to support some of these impacted communities? Yeah, check out Alice Street uh, Film. Uh, dot com uh, for more information about the film. Uh, we have a website there which uh, will have an impact page um, that will follow the story. Uh, again, in spring 2021, we'll be going uh, up and down the state uh, with the film. We'll be doing some kind of outside screenings um, um, in socially distant ways to um, in, have people come together to watch films. And then we're also planning to do some virtual screenings as well. Um, and, you know, bring our community. We'd love to, to have it shown, you know, um, around, uh, around the country, around the world, uh, wherever um, it could be of, of use. We'd love to, to have it there. But um, again, thank you for the opportunity. I don't know if Desi has anything else you'd like to say. Um, just the Alice Street uh, website also has a merchandise page and um, a, a portion of the proceeds, and I don't know how much it is, uh, goes towards uh, you know, expanding the reach of the impact project. Um, so okay. you, know, you can represent, you know, and I think that that would be really tight. You know, it's always cool just to see like the mural again in other places. So I'm mean, really honored that that mural continues to travel, even though a condominium standing right in front of it at this point. So. Mm, yeah, be great. Thank you guys both uh, again for joining us and taking this time to share more about your work. And we wish you all the best and hope to see you again over the course of the fest. Thank you thank so much. You. No worries. And to our audience, thanks for joining us for the Q&A for Alice Street. Be sure to view. Bye for now. Bye.